everyone and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Dr Penny Bickle. I am a senior lecturer in archaeology here at the University of York. My specialism is the transition from hunting and gathering to farming so bread is right up my street and I'm really excited that both Rob and you have chosen to join us this afternoon. I have a few technical notes before we begin. If you're watching live you can ask questions and we really encourage you to do so using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have any technical issues such as a loss of Wi-Fi you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded so you'll be able to watch again uh, when you wish to. Subtitles are available for this event as well. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So thank you for joining Slow Rise, an adventure in bread making. This is based on a book by Robert Penn, who is a journalist, a woodsman, a lifelong cyclist, and the author of several books, including the Sunday Times bestseller, It's All About the Bike, and The Man Who Made Things Out of Trees. He lives in the Black Mountains, South Wales, with his wife, three children, two spaniels, 12 bicycles, and a collection of axes. He makes, he, sorry, he bakes his own bread in a wood-fired oven. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rob. How are things in the Black Mountains? Uh, well, good, actually. Dry and uh, a rather beautiful day. A little bit of cloud cover, but plenty uh, of, of broken sunshine. Actually, all is good in the world. Lovely, wonderful to hear and wonderful for you to join us from such a great part of the world. So can I start this event by asking where your interest in bread and making your own bread came from? Uh, so it's, it's a slightly protracted story in that, um, so like a lot of people I think of my age, so I, you know, I'm in my early 50s, you know, grew up in the 1970s eating white sliced bread. You know, my brother and I used to, eat entire loaves of sun blessed in one sitting and, you know, toast eating contests. And then I would say that the same white bread, you know, remained a significant part of my diet all the way through university and, you know, working in London in the 90s. And I didn't really know that there was any other kind of bread. You know, I remember the famous Hovis advert with, a, you know, delivery boy pushing the bicycle up the cobbled street to... Dvorak's New World Symphony, but I had no interest in eating that kind of bread. You know, it was just white sliced um, for me. And that, and that was it, really. I didn't really know anything else. And then I gave up a career as a lawyer in my late 20s, in the kind of mid 1990s, and rode a bicycle around the world for three years. And, you know, discovered this extraordinary, you know, bread culture that exists almost everywhere except here, it seemed to. And, you know, my sort of life became enriched because of this bread. You know, I mean, you cross a country like, I don't know, Italy is a good example, but you could choose many, Iran, for example, and the bread changes from county to county, you know, not country by country. And, and then I came back from that. Bread culture, you know, as we know it today, the kind of emergence of artisan baking and home baking was just stirring then. And... This is a very protracted answer to a very simple question. And, and, and kind of simultaneously, I became... So I basically went back to eating white bread when I got back to the United Kingdom and became ill. And, you know, I kind of couldn't work out what it was. Uh, you know, when I was cycling around the world, you drink an awful lot of tap water by the side of the road. So I'd had all sorts of stomach ailments, which I presumed had come back to haunt me. And then slowly but surely, I began to rationalise what was in my diet to see if there was something wrong with my diet. And I stumbled across celiac illness. And so I had a celiac test, very serious autoimmune disease, which you know, which you probably know lots about. You know, something like one percent of the world's population suffers from celiac. We've known about it for thousands of years. You know, it, it's a the, the protein in bread called gluten, which causes a, a, a very serious reaction in the uh, lower intestine. Anyway, I had the test. I was not celiac. And then just out of interest, I started to read about bread. 
and realized that this could well be the one component of my diet which is making me ill. So I stopped eating it. Industrial bread, modern bread. And, and I got better very quickly. And then probably five or six years, I had five or six years without eating any bread whatsoever. Uh, you eat a lot of oat cakes when you're doing that, I can tell you. Uh, and then someone bought, this is probably about eight, nine years ago now, a sourdough starter to our house and, you know, gifted it to us. And my wife started baking sourdough bread. And then I learned to bake bread, still didn't eat it. And, you know, watched the kids tuck into it. And it's a kind of form of torture, baking bread at home, but refusing to eat it because the smell, as everybody knows, is so good. And then eventually I started eating it and realised that it, it, it didn't make me ill, that I could eat it. And so I started to read about why this might be, you know, exploring, you know, what it, what it might be, what part of the difference between modern bread and the bread that our ancestors cherished, you know, might be making me ill. And I concluded that it was to do with fermentation time. Anyway, that put me off on a journey to read more and more about bread. And, you know, I, you know, as all of my books illustrate, I've basically become obsessed about the subject, about one subject at a time. Uh, and so I became obsessed about bread and ended up growing some of my own wheat to make my own bread at home in a bread oven. That, that is an amazing story and a fantastic journey. And um, you capture it really wonderfully in the book, Slow Rise. And so uh, in Slow Rise, you really chart through the whole history of bread from growing the cereals through to harvesting, through to, to different ways of baking, to milling the flour. It's really a fascinating journey. You begin um, in Turkey, where cereals, of course, were first domesticated and grown as crops, and then to Egypt, where you learned traditional harvesting methods alongside people still growing um, uh, cereals in, in perhaps ways they've been doing for hundreds of years. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your journeys to Turkey and to Egypt. I'm sure people would love to hear about them today, and uh, perhaps a little bit about what you learned through those journeys, but also what what kind of reactions do you think that people might have had to our white bread that, that, that is found in supermarkets here today? Yeah. So, um, it's, I mean, yes, so to, I'll, I'll talk about Turkey and Egypt because, I mean, really, you know, the, 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 as you know, actually, I feel slightly reluctant talking about the origins of human civilization with you, Penny. Um, so I think you probably know rather more about it than I do. Anyway, um, so I went to, Stay in a village next to the uh, archaeological site at Gebekli Tepe near San Liofa in southeast Anatolia near the border with um, Syria, the Turkish border with Syria. And th this was the apex of the Fertile Crescent. And the two species of wheat which were wild um, pre the dawn of civilization pre the agricultural revolution were called einkorn and emma and uh, we know that they still grow in the wild on this in and around this massif called karashadag um which is probably about 100 kilometers due southeast of from gebekli tepe and you know the very clever geneticists you know improvements in genetics in the 1990s allowed us to establish that the the, the domesticated varieties of einkorn and emma are most closely closely associated with the wild einkorn and emma which grow around this massive. So that really is, you know, you can pinpoint, you know, you can put a finger on a map to show where human civilization began. And so I thought, well, if I'm gonna start the journey anywhere, that, that looks like a pretty logical place to start it um, with wheat you know, uh, the, the most important cereal over the course of, the preeminent cereal over the course of human civilization. And, and, and I had already established by this point that what I wanted to do was to, you know, plant an acre of heritage grains, of ancient grains. Ancient, and, I, and I decided to plant two, we can talk about the other one in a minute, and one of them was going to be Emma, which was, I, th I think, I believe, the archaeological evidence is pretty clear. It's the first variety of wheat ever planted in the UK, in Britain. Um, and so I, I decided to get to go with Emma. 
And I, what I wanted to do was to use pre-industrial practices. You know, planting an acre of wheat, actually the job's done pretty quickly with machinery. So I thought I would indulge myself slightly in doing it. You know, so I ploughed the field with horses uh, and a plough and I wanted to broadcast the wheat by hand. Um, and, you know, so that's sort of pre-turnip towns end of the seed drill. And, and I thought, you know, if you've got to learn about broadcasting wheat anyway, you might as well go to the apex of the Fertile Crescent, where people really only stop doing it within our lifetimes. And I found this wonderful man called Mahmoud Yildiz. And Mahmoud, you know, he's a, you know, this was actually probably only about my age, but, you know, great big grey bearded man. And, and he remembered as a young boy sowing without machinery by hand and he taught me how to to sow wheat how to broadcast it by hand you know and it obviously it's something that looks pretty easy on paper right but actually it's quite complicated and to get it right takes a certain amount of skill so i went to try and learn about that skill from him and it was it was magical and what did he think about our bread well you know the i mean i'm sure we may come on to talk about the chorley wood bread process at some point you know which is for me a kind of nadir of bread but the chorley wood bread process is i'm afraid everywhere globally now i mean it's just employed in so many countries and the bread that i ate with Mahmoud and his family you know in their village house obviously made from their wheat and it was absolutely delicious everything's milled at home threshed at home milled at home and but, you know, you go, a, you know, a mile down a dirt track and you come to a main road and on the main road is a bakery selling basically what is modern bread, you know, to an awful lot of Turkish people. So they're losing it. You know, they even they are losing their bread culture, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the other place that I went to learn how to harvest was uh, Upper Egypt, so the Nile Delta. And, and and I went to a place called Sharkia province, which is basically the major wheat growing province of ancient Egypt, the time of the pharaohs. Um, and I'm sure you know, again, rather more about this than I do. So I'm trying to walk you on eggshells here. But, um, so, you know, went to this, um, so, you know, it took me a long time to find somebody through, you know, the small network of Egyptian contacts that I had to find somebody who actually processes wheat by hand, so harvest by hand and, and threshes by hand. And, you know, this wonderful man, Mohammed, you know, I spent a kind of, you know, day, day and a half with him learning how to harvest with a sickle. And, you know, he made a very good case for why he still uses a sickle, um, which, you know, which I won't, I won't go into now, but he makes a very good case for why you basically, you, you if you use machinery, you lose quite a lot of your yield. And so for the small, small areas of production that he, he was in, involved in, he thought it was more efficient to use a sickle. So he cut the sickle with his two nephews and I spent, like I said, a day and a half in a field with him learning how to use a sickle. And the, you know, the glorious thing about that was, um, you know, the anti-diluvian experience, you know, it's an extraordinary thing to be on your haunches um, using a sickle. And as an archeologist, you will know this better than others. You know, it, 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 it's a very powerful thing to be there doing that, thinking that, you know, highly likely that somebody has cut wheat with a sickle uh, in this field, the same field that I stood in every April for 6,000 years. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there aren't many things in this life that afford such a sort of profound you know, it's like going down an elevator shaft back into the human experience. And um, and, and I, I, I love that. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And, and, and you, with that elevator analogy, you capture that sense of sort of persistency really well, um, that, that these cereals that, that are parts of our diet now have, have been parts of our diet for a really long time. So given that, that there's this span of time, when did it go wrong for bread? Oh, you God. talked a little bit uh, about the chorley yeah. wood process, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what went wrong. It's a, it's a really interesting one, you know, and I think, you know, there are many analogies, many, many, many other aspects of, you know, modern life where things have gone wrong. So things went wrong in a so succession of wrong turns, basically, were made, you know, and generally speaking, they were made with 
good intentions. You know, it, it, it would be easy, you know, for me with hindsight to try and paint them, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the decision was made with, uh, you know, gr gross economic profit in mind or, you know, some, some, something like that. But actually, they, they were generally speaking made with good intentions. So the first one and a really significant one and one that is still very difficult to break down today was the transition from stone grinding grain to produce flour uh, to steel roller milling. So basically between the invention of the Vitruvian water mill, which is, you know, just before the time of Christ in Rome, all grains, not just, sorry, all cereal grains, not just wheat, but, you know, barley and oats and others, but particularly with reference to wheat, were ground on stone. And what that meant was the three components of a grain of wheat, which are the, the outer coating, the bran, the germ, which is, you know, the new plant, and the endosperm, which is kind of starch, the larder for the new plant in the early days of its life. Grinding them on stone meant that it was incredibly difficult to separate those three components. And to do that, you know, the early man used sieves and then we, you know, we evolved a little bit mechanically, but not very much. It was incredibly difficult to do. So, and the, the, the greatest nutritional value for humans lies in the germ and the bran. And the endosperm is basically what we would call white flour and it's pure starch. And it doesn't have the micronutrients in the soil, which tend to be in the germ and the bran, and it doesn't have the bran itself, which is incredibly good for the human biota. So steel roller milling, which completely revolutionized milling from kind of the 1850s in waves through to the 1870s, and then it hit the USA, and the process became a kind of industrialized in the USA on the edge of the Great Plains where, you know, wheat production had just gone through its own enormous progressive evolution. So the steel roller milling basically meant that it was incredibly easy to separate the germ and the bran from the endosperm to make pure white flour. And that pleased the emerging league of large scale bakeries who found it much easier to bake with white flour than with wholemeal flour for all sorts of technical biological reasons, but it's just much, much easier. White flour, standardized, long life, um, and easy to transport even across oceans. So um, it is transport in that it doesn't go rancid. Wholemeal flour can go rancid very quickly because it has oils in it, quite apart from anything else. So steel roller milling was a first important step. And then, what followed were a succession of, you know, equally dramatic, detrimental measures, detrimental to the cause of nutritional value of bread. So plant hybridization basically, you know, got a huge, came, came through some waves, step forward around the turn of the century. Um, the industrial baking process grew bigger and bigger. So they wanted, you know, more and more stable flour, and they wanted it highly standardized so they knew exactly what it would do in the bakery process, in the baking process. So hybridization went, hybridization basically focused on yield rather than taste and flavor and nutritional value. And the industrial, industrial process focused on speed, industrial baking process focused on speed. And that manifested itself, we mentioned it earlier, in the Chorley Wood bread process. And the Chorleywood bread process was invented in 1963. And this is a very good example of, you know, a well-intended measure. So the Chorleywood bread process was basically invented by a team of British chemists in order to try and use low-protein British wheat. So during the Second World War and after the war, Canadian wheat, there'd be this sort of huge river of Canadian wheat that flowed into Britain during, this, during and after the Second World War. And it was really, really difficult for British farmers to sell their low protein wheat to millers to go into the baking process. So they invented the Chorleywood bread process. The, the, the concept was to allow the bakers to make good bread, risen bread, with low protein British wheat. And it was supposed to favour the small bakeries that existed in towns all the way across Britain. 
in the end, it favoured the industrial bakers. You know, Canadian bakeries grew even stronger and stronger. More Canadian investment poured into the British baking process. And Chorley Wood Bread um, created what I would, you, you know, you would have to say was basically the nadir of bread in the human experience. Yeah, that's a very passionate response. I can see how passionately you feel about it, especially after uh, baking your own bread. Perhaps you could talk us through then a little bit about this journey that you went on. I loved uh, reading about your experiences in the field with growing your, your own wheat, but also then learning to become a master baker yourself and supplying your family's bread for a year. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that growing of cereals and then and then perhaps we'll go on to answering some of the questions that we're getting coming in about, about the process of making bread. Okay, great. Yeah, so I planted an acre of wheat, two varieties. One, we already mentioned it, was Emma, you know, which is one of the founder crops um, uh, at, at, at the uh, domestication of our species. And has kind of been around ever since. It is, it, it became at some point, you know, several hundred years ago, a kind of relic crop. So it's still grown around Europe particularly in Tuscany, where it's an uh, IGP you know, in the area north of Lucca, where they grow a lot of it. Uh, and they grow, actually, they grow einkorn, emma, and spelt there. And so uh, ancient grain, um, difficult to process for t- t- slightly technical reasons, which I won't go into, but makes really tasty bread. But it's notoriously difficult to bake with. And lots of people use it in other things, particularly in Tuscany, where it's integrated into the kind of peasant diet and, you know, m- m- you know uh, million, million different ways. And then the other variety of wheat that I grew was an old British land race. And I'll just talk very quickly about land race wheats because it's an incredibly interesting story. And this really bears upon the whole story of bread as well. So for, I mean, well, basically since the beginning of agriculture in the Fertile Crescent 10,000 years ago, 11,000, 11,000 years ago. What farmers did was they seed saved every summer before harvest or whatever time of year they harvested. Seed saved just before harvest. And and what that meant was to plant out next year. So what that meant was that the plumpest ears of wheat with the largest grains got collected uh, every year and, and put back in, were sowed back into the land um, for the next cycle. And over centuries, millennia, what happened was land race populations, genetically different land race populations emerged across the world in you know, multiple places because of local soil quality and microclimates. And this wonderful chap who really helped me on my journey, a chap called Andy Forbes, he um, maintains a website called Brockwell Bait Gateway, and he has information on 400,000 different wheat accessions that are, are documented in seed banks all over the planet. You know, and that, that's just the ones that are documented, right? So really, you know, in the kind of, you know, 19th, early 20th century, when scientists realised that we were beginning to lose genetic diversity in wheat, they started to seed save these species. So we got, we got 400,000 or so into seed banks, but there may be many, many more than that. We just simply have no idea. So that incredible genetic diversity in wheat, we basically abandoned all of that. Anyway, around Britain, you know, there were multiple land races grown at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, rather like apples, they have wonderful names, you know, orange, Devon, blue, rough chaff, you know, Montgomery red, April bearded, Kent old hoary, you know, it, it, you know, they go on and on. And the wheat that you grew in, you know, West Wales was significantly different from the land race population wheat that you would have grown in, let's say, Suffolk. And indeed, the bread would have tasted differently. Yeah. And I often wonder about this. I mean, you know, magical idea that you could have done, you know, bicycle ride across Britain and eaten bread in every county and it would have tasted different in every place. Anyway, the 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 one land so land race wheats were basically replaced by hybridized wheats. So the you know the agronomists, the emerging army uh, of agronomists came to farms and said what you want to do is you want to abandon your land low yield 
land raised wheat, which happens to produce tasty and flavoursome bread, but that's of no interest because now farming is all about money. And what we suggest is you you plant this hybridised wheat. And what we've done is we've crossed two varieties of wheat to create a high yield in this type of wheat with certain other qualities. So losing genetic diversity all the time. The, the land raised wheat that we know was grown the longest into the 1930s in anywhere in Britain was called Hengumra, and it was grown in West Wales. And it was minutely adapted for wet summers. You know, if you've ever been on holiday in Pembrokeshire, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and 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 this hengumra was grown into the 1930s and was seed saved weirdly at the Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg, where it remained, you know, in a drawer until about 10 years ago when a British baker and activist called Andrew Whitley. Um, who was formerly a BBC Russian correspondent, went and visited the Vavilov Institute and got literally an envelope of this seed back. And then it was grown out and grown out and grown out and bulked up and bulked up over successive years so that I could have some. And it's actually been grown by several farmers in Wales now, which is fantastic. So those are the two varieties that I planted. Uh, so I was a whiz you through the year experience, kind of almost everything that went wrong that could have gone wrong went wrong so we had a winter flood uh and the uh, the acre that i had had a kind of dip in the middle of the field so that you know became a bog and lots of the 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 wheat which had emerged there and was vernalizing over winter died then you know the the acre that i had was up against the railway line so there was you know i mean an army of rabbits living in the in the in the bank of the railway track and they came out and had epicurean feasts in my fields uh all all the way through spring and and then uh i i got a uh, wheat disease um called stem rust which affected growth and then there was would you believe it a drought in wales so it didn't rain for eight weeks in sort of may and june which is just really not what you want i don't know if this is a sign of climate change or or, or, or just a sign of a you know got unlucky and it was widely recognized as the you know one of the worst harvests in modern times uh by by you know serious farmers anyway so everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong harvested with a sickle uh, as i learned to do in egypt you know managed to drag my slightly long-suffering kids into the field to help me um i mean <laughs> um, yeah they're still asking me to explain why that why that happened i had to bribe them with ice creams and then i threshed and winnowed the grain at home threshing is really interesting point about threshing and i'll just make this very briefly is, is that threshing no one tells you this threshing is an incredibly uh, boring stultifying work i mean it, 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 it is and it feels like penal work and you know i stumbled across this statistic somewhere and i've never seen it qualified but you know pre-mechanization of farming so you know the first threshing machine was invented in 1786 before that it is estimated that threshing took up one quarter of all agricultural manpower over the course of a year which is extraordinary, but it just takes hours and hours and hours. And then you have the very beautiful process of winnowing, which is separating the wheat from the chaff. And I did it in the traditional way in a basket. So you put the wheat in this and you sweep it off the threshing floor, put it into a basket, wait for the wind to blow, stand outside and you throw it up in the air and the wind takes the chaff away and all the grain lands back down. And you know that, that was a very elegant, very beautiful part of the process, really enjoyed that. And then I took the grain out to a water mill in West Wales, run by some fantastic people called Andrew and Anne Perry, uh, and in Clamrusted, facing the Irish Sea. And the, the mill's called Fellinganol, and they produce flour from heritage grains grown by Welsh farmers, and the flour's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, I took it to them and had it milled into flour and brought it back, um, by which point, I think by which point I built a bread oven, and then I had to learn how to bake with wholemeal flour. So most of my sourdough baking up to this point had been done with either white flour or brown flour and the odd experiment of wholemeal. So, you know, this is where I learned about wholemeal. And it, it, it's actually really difficult baking with wholemeal because it is 
it, you know, active. There's a huge amount, particularly just after it's been milled, huge amount of enzymatic activ activity going on, which makes it incredibly difficult to predict what, you know, what you're going to get. So, you know, I baked a lot of what my kids called Stone Age Frisbees, you know, they were, you know, about an inch high and oh, sort of that wide and about an inch high. I mean, it was really disastrous. And, um, you know, and, and this, of course, is, you know, in the context of, you know, artisan baking. I mean, you go on Instagram or, you know, we've got a really good bakery here in Abergavenny now. So, you know, you know, in your mind's eye, what a beautiful risen, you know, crusted, lightly dusted with flour loaf looks like. Mine looked nothing like that. And I went on this quite long journey, kind of modifying the process, learning about baking, went and spent some time with a Breton baker um, called Nicolas Supio, who's kind of a bit of a guru and, and you know, he's wonderful. And he bakes all, he's, he bakes the most amazing bread, uh, probably the most amazing bread I've ever eaten. Anyway, you know, I spent some time with him, discovered this process called auto lees, which is a bit technical and it's one for the bakers and I won't go into it. Um, and then finally started to bake you know, well, well risen wholemeal loaves. And um, the culmination, as you may remember from the book, Penny was winning the bread prize at my local agricultural show, the Lantony Show, which um, which was, you know, I mean, my, 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 my award is on the wall there. <laughs> I'm sure it was incredibly competitive as well as those kind of local um, yeah. uh, fates often are. Um, I'm going to start uh, asking some of the questions that people are posting in the Q&A now. Um, and I expect a lot of people will have been experimenting with sourdough themselves over lockdown. I know a lot of people, a lot of people were. Um, so I, I imagine that you're happy to take questions both about your experiences with the bread, but also perhaps some of those questions from home bakers. Um, yeah. Without about that, bread itself. So Ruth has asked, can you make bread out of leftover beer yeast? If you've taken up both beer brewing and bread making during lockdown, can you can you combine those activities? Yes, you absolutely can. So it's 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 called balm. Um, you know, I mean, again, Penny, you probably know more about this than I do. So uh, the, the 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 yeasty scum on the top of beer is called balm, and that word is still in use. So in the northwest of England, you know, Lancashire, a bread roll is called a barn cake. And we don't know the origin of risen bread, but it is thought that we probably started eating risen bread round about three and a half thousand BC in Egypt and in ancient Egypt. Uh, under the pharaohs and what you know it is conceivable and lots of archaeologists and okay botanists and historians have you know propagated this idea that so up to that point we ate flatbreads right you know and you know all around the fertile crescent is still a culture of flatbreads very very important and so yeast was introduced conceivably to bread dough by mistake when you know let's imagine a uh, cook in so the brewing and baking facilities of an Egyptian house were in this under the same roof and you know the yeast somehow made a leap from the top of a brewing barrel of beer barley beer it would have been to a bowl of yeast dough which had been prepared probably to be cooked as flatbreads and then let's imagine for a moment that the cook, you know, was neglectful of his duties and forgot to, to, to take the dough and to put it into the bread oven to make flatbreads and left it for 24 hours and came back the next day to discover that the dough had multiplied or trebled in size to his alarm and then baked that. And that could well be the origins of um, risen bread. But certainly, balm the scum from the top of, you know, uh, uh, brewing beer was used in bread making up, up, in, up, up into the modern era. There's a question here which I think relates to that in that, um, could you use balm then to make sourdough bread? What kind yes. of flavour beer would it, I guess, what kind of flavour bread would the, that, that kind of produce? 
So I don't think it would produce, I don't know, I've never tried. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm fair, but I'm fairly confident in saying it wouldn't produce beer flavoured bread. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is such a thing as beer bread, right? Which is generally speaking bread made with balm. But I, so I don't think it would taste of beer significantly. But it, so it, but yes, you know, you, 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 you certainly can, but I don't think it would influence the flavour significantly. You know, the subtlety in kind of, you know, much is written about sourdough starters and the the bacteria and the yeast that you get in a sourdough starter and, you know, sourdough starters, you know, slightly too much guff written about them. You know, so Andy Forbes, you know, there, there, there's anecdotal evidence that some sourdough starters have been alive for hundreds of years, right? So, you know, I got the one that we inherited in our house called Bernard, you know, it came from a neighbour yeah, and, and she'd had it for several years. And before that, another neighbour had had it for several years. So, you know, we know it's been going at least 20 years in, you know, the Black Mountains, Bernard has. Andy Forbes, this chap I was telling you about, who runs, you know, manages this website with all the wheat accessions on it. He has a starter that, a starter that originated on the island of Ischia in the Mediterranean in 1762 or something, I think. So, but, you know, this, I mean, so what... You know the, the the science of a Saturday starter we're only really beginning to understand now, uh, and you know to, to find out how it works, and the minute biological chemical changes that take place when it matures or um, when it ferments, and generally speaking, you know you if you've got a Saturday starter in your house, Penny, it will have local bacteria and yeast, uh, and then if you gave it to me you all started to me over a period of time, it would adapt to become a starter which was local to my kitchen and my environment. So they would become two different living things uh, over a period of time. So they micro-adapt to their circumstances, local yeast and bacteria, basically. Oh, fantastic. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I have a borrowed a sourdough starter for this um, event and actually had a go at making my own wholemeal sourdough so my friend Jessie very kindly lent me her sourdough and then I think I'll hold that up to the screen this is the recipe in the back of of Rob's book for wholemeal sourdough and it was delicious we had half of it for lunchtime and um we're I'm so proud it's one of the reasons I'm showing it now um an absolutely fantastic recipe and a delicious bread um at the end of it okay I'm gonna ask uh go through some of the more questions now so um someone has asked could you tell us more about your experiences while traveling around bread culture did anything surprise you or intrigue you around the cultural connections to bread? Um, I mean, I just sort of read, you know, a huge amount about it before I went travelling anyway. So one of the interesting things about Egypt is, so you know, so lot, lot, you know, lots of areas, as you might imagine, of the parts, parts of the ancient Fertile Crescent the Middle East today consume more bread than anywhere else on the planet in Egypt among them. And the traditional Arabic word for bread is chubs. And, and it, you know, so w- one of the lovely things to discover was that in Egypt, bread is not called chubs. It is called aish. And aish literally translates as life. And it is, you know, bread in Egypt is just everywhere. You know, the kind of small pitters that are sold for breakfast, but throughout the day, you know, from first light, uh, in in Cairo, you know, you will see wooden carts being wheeled down the road, piled high with pitters uh, to be taken to markets. And I spent a lot of time in uh, bakeries in and around the old city in Cairo, and it was fantastic. That was fantastic. I think perhaps the the kind of biggest revelation was discovering that for me, at least, the bread capital of the world is Jerusalem. And so that I definitely hadn't anticipated. So I was going to Jerusalem anyway to, to write about food. So it's going through a bit of a food renaissance, you know, inspired by people like Otto Lenghi. And, in, uh, and, I, and I went to look at matzah, which is their flatbread, which is incredibly important in um, Jewish culture. And in Jerusalem, of course, you know, when, you know, the Jewish diaspora arrived in uh, you know, back in Israel over the course of the 20th century, they came from everywhere. You know, they came from um, Yemen and uh, Iraq and Iran and, um, you know, Turkey and Armenia and Georgia and Romania and Hungary and Poland. And they all bought their bread cultures with them. 
And, you know, they all immediately set up bakeries to serve their local communities. And generally speaking, all of those bread cultures have been sustained and they and they remain. So, you know, in a kind of hour long walk around the bakeries of, you know, some of the quarters of um, not just inside the old city, but all over Jerusalem, you you know, it's, it's like doing a bread tour of the world. And I, I and I you know, that so that was a huge revelation to me. The bread there is off the scale good. And um, you write wonderfully about it in the book. That was one of my favourite bits. I really felt like I could taste the bread in Jerusalem while I was reading that. So if anyone is, I uh, encourage anyone who is um, thinking about it to buy Rob's book and, and, and to get to read about, about the experience in Jerusalem. So Steve has asked, um, uh, I, get, I think talking about the history of wheat, that um, does this mean that virtually all bread is then a genetically modified product? So I guess this is about the way wheat has been manipulated and bred. Yes, okay. So, um, no is a short answer. So I'm not a geneticist or, or an agronomist. And I think there are many different interpretations of what genetic modified modification means. But um, all modern wheat is hybridised, heavily aggressively hybridized you know so that's when you take two so wheat is generally self-pollinating and uh, in the wild self-pollinating obviously so it's really easy to hybridize so you take you know two types of wheat that you would like to take the best qualities from and you uh, and you cross them and then you plant out the seed that you get as, as, a, as a product and so so all modern wheat is hybridized um you know, heavily hybridized now. So, you know, when I say that there are 400,000 accessions in this uh, wheat database, Brockwell Bank Gateway, you know, if you are a modern wheat grower in the United Kingdom and you buy your seed from a seed merchant, there are a small handful each year of seeds that you'll be offered, which the millers, you know, for industrial bread will would would like to take. So, so that kind of modification is, again, you know, and I've said this already, it was all about yield. Completely forgot about taste and flavour and indeed interesting baking qualities. So it's about standardisation of the product and it's about yield. So not they're not all genetically modified, but they are all aggressively and heavily hybridised. Thank you. Um, so I guess a question sort of building on that from Felicity is asking you where you see the future of wheat agriculture and industrial bread making going. Do you think the revival of, of home baking is, is going to challenge that? Is, but certainly artisanal bakers are everywhere now. Yeah. So I think that it has to. So, you know, where I would track what is happening now so that's the rise of artisanal baking in the United Kingdom, home baking and, you know, micro bakeries and small, you know, sourdough bakeries in uh, towns and some incidents, instances in villages. I would track, you know, that what, what was happening right now back to the revival of wholemeal baking by the hippies in California in the 1960s. And... So that's, you know, a kind of slow rise, title of the book. Uh, that's a kind of slow, sorry, I didn't mean that. Uh, uh, proper plug. Yeah, that, that's a slow, very, very gentle rise in the, in, you know, in real bread, in interest in real bread. Um, it's been going on a long time. And I think, and that, you know, that, that to me has the feel of sustainability about it. You know, so it's not just a huge spike in interest in something which could drop off as fast as it emerged. And, you know, I, I'm a real believer. You know, Wendell Berry, um, you know, great American farmer and writer, wrote that eating is an agricultural act. And, you know, I'm a great believer that, you know, you, we, people, you know, have far greater political influence in the choices that we make every day when we go shopping uh, and buy the food that we that we that we can eat than in voting in national local elections or in protesting uh, on the streets at any point. And so, I mean, I think it's incredibly important that that 
that rise of real bread continues because if you you know if you don't break that down, the future looks pretty terrible actually. So it looks terrible for wheat. So taking the diversity out of wheat over successive generations since the beginning of the 20th century and even a bit earlier than that has done inordinate damage to um, to wheat itself and now leaves it in an incredibly precarious place in terms of exposure to new um, fungal attacks and new diseases and even old diseases, actually. So one of the things that I... So that's that's... You know, uh, so we started off talking about bread and now we're talking about wheat. And so one of the things I observed in the course of my research was that actually the, the number of really, really great, clever people out there doing something about building genetic diversity back into bread wheat. And so this chap called Ed Dickin, who is uh, a lecturer at, at um, an agricultural college in Shropshire. So Ed's doing this chap I mentioned, Andy Forbes. So he's trying to revive lots of heritage grains, you know, from all sorts of periods of you know British agriculture, trying to get them back into production. You know, it's it's like um, you know with uh, you know native breed cattle. You know, you basically save them by eating them. It's the same thing with these bread wheats. You know, if you eat the bread made from heritage grains, that means that the bakers will demand more of it. And, and that means that the growers will be asked to grow more of it. So it's a kind of virtuous circle in that respect if you if you eat it. So, you know, going into a bakery, your artisanal bakery, do asking if they bake with heritage grains, that basically will put genetic diversity back into wheat. So, so Ed Dickens doing it. So he, what he's doing, and then there's a uh, really interesting institution in Washington State in the USA called the Bread Lab. And what they're doing is they are basically hybridizing kind of, you know, high yield modern wheats with um, heritage grains to try and produce a not one single one lots of varieties of wheat that yield well so they're attractive to the farmer and have really interesting baking qualities so the bakers like baking with them and which have taste and flavor and and you know that's not beyond us you know that's pretty straightforward as i said hybridizing wheat is really quite straightforward so that that's that you know these processes are emerging in different places simultaneously, which I think is a very good sign. So there's a lot of things to look forward to for bread makers coming up. I think so, yeah. um, and, you know, and there's a lot of good bread to eat while we're waiting. So. <laughs> yes. So Helen says that she's looking forward to getting an oven so she can bake by hand instead of using the bread maker or instead of in the yeah. bread maker. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about... Um, Hand, hand uh, making bread and kneading bread, and if you've got any tips about that for when Helen gets her oven. Okay, so um, so making sourdough at home. So basically, making sourdough with white flour is is pretty straightforward. And once you've got the knack, it's a tiny bit of knack. It's about time, and it's about building that kind of time into your daily schedule. Your, actually, your weekly schedule. You know, so you know you need to. Th- you know, if you're going to bake on Saturday morning, you know, you need to get your starter out of the fridge on probably Wednesday night, I would. And so you take your starter out of the fridge, you refresh it once, possibly twice, you know, and then each time you refresh it, you leave it for 8, 10, 12 hours until it's bubbling beautifully. And then you might refresh it a second time, you know, making sourdough bread with a really strong, lively starter is you know, that's 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 the road to glory. And and then you make your dough. And then you bake on, you know, make your dough on Friday night, leave it to prove over uh, 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 during, during the night time. And then on Saturday morning, you knock it back and then you put it in the oven and you bake with it. So baking with oven, baking oven, I would advise using a cloche, you know, or a Dutch oven or an old pan, which has got a lid, which kind of fits the loaf in nicely. It's much easier than just baking it on a hot stone. So that I think that's a very good place to start with pure white, strong white bread flour. And I know that kind of, that's kind of, you know, counter to everything I've just been saying about wholemeal flour, but it's step one. And once you've mastered that, then you start to play with proportions of white flour and wholemeal. And, you know, I would start at 50-50, so 50% wholemeal. And, you know, if, if, if you're kind of following my mantra, I would buy 
wholemeal flour that has been stone ground uh, and, and, it, and it comes from heritage grains and you will get the richest and most complex flavours from that flour. And then marry that with 50% strong white bread flour, which has you know high protein content, which gives the the, the dough loads of oomph when it's rising. So you'll, you know, you'll you'll get beautifully risen loaves and your family will go, ah, my goodness me, you know. And you know, all the time in this, let's not forget that you know, bread is bound up with all sorts of important human values like sociability. You know, bread is for sharing. Companion, you know, the word comes from um together with bread, you know, the Latin words. Uh com and panis together with bread so it's incredibly important so then you start with 50 50 sourdough uh, sorry wholemeal and 50 percent white and then i play with that and i would work towards you know 90 percent wholemeal heritage grain stone ground flour and 10 percent high protein uh, white flour and see where you get to and if you're nailing that then you know head for 100 percent wholemeal and the nutritional value of that is just sensational Fantastic. Um, I'm going to nip down the questions a little bit just to this one because it's um, really relevant for, for now. How do you deal with the high te higher temperatures? I tend to bake in bulk and freeze the surplus, but I need three loaves in the fridge, which is difficult. How do you develop the rich flavours without the long, cold ferment in the summer? Uh, so, I, um, so I think I uh, understood that question. So it is harder, yeah, uh, to do that but actually I, so I try and ferment so we've got uh, I live in an old farmhouse and um, uh, you know I mean basically it's cold all year round so <laughs> um, you know it's uh, stone and it's kind of cold all year round so it doesn't really ever warm up and we've got you know room in the house is called the dairy and it was you know would have been where the you know farmhouse produce was left so it stays very cold all the way through summer it's you know facing away from the south and it stays very cold all summer so i tend to ferment in there slowly and get the kind of rich you know complex flavors that you're trying to get through the fermentation process um over and above that you know don't have sort of much much really good advice on that okay um, here's uh, another question. I'm going to scroll back up again. Sorry. Um, to what extent have you found breads around the world made from grains other than wheat? So rather than wheat. Oh yeah, no, really. Uh, so and I've experimented myself. Um, you know, made barley bread. Um, so you know, obviously maize flour. You know, it's really interesting historical. Um, uh, It'd be really, really, really important. So, when, you know, when we, when, you know, when our ancestors arrived in the New World in America, in the USA, at the end of the 17th century, you know, they they couldn't get wheat to grow. Obviously, they took wheat seeds with them on the Pilgrim Fathers, took wheat seeds with them, but they couldn't get it to grow. So they ended up eating what was called rye and Injun. It's bread made of made, made from rye and maize, rye and maize mix. And I've eaten that. Um, not really to my taste, if I'm honest, but it's okay. Um, I think the kind of biggest one and one that we are neglectful of appreciating in this country is German bread culture. So you could make a very good case that the richest bread culture in the world is German. You know, German bread, I would argue, is much better than French bread, much better than Italian bread, you know, better than... I mean, so I'd put, I'd put Iranian bread right up there. I think Iranian bread's incredibly good. And that tends to be... Part flatbreads, part semi-risen uh, flatbreads, which are really, you know, so the, the naan bread is the semi-risen flatbread that we're most common with here. But anyway, going back to German bread. So German bread, obviously, it was historically really difficult to get wheat to grow well in northern latitudes because of soil temperatures over the winter. So, so they preferred rye and, you know, rye bread culture is fantastic. You know, and I've eaten it in Russia, where it's basically like chewing a brick, you know, it's, you know, very little flavour and, you know, you lose a molar with each mouthful. But um, German bread culture, they have advanced, I mean, it's incredibly rich and complex and they probably have more variety of bread sold on a, you know, quotidian basis than any other country uh, on the planet. And it's fantastic. So, so I really, really enjoyed exploring German breads and tried to bake some myself as well with limited success 
<laughs> so here is a, a very good question, I think, probably to bring us uh, to a close or our last question before we lead out, which is from Charles, which is what's a fun bread to make this weekend for a home baker? So if you're at home and you wanted to encourage kids or you were at home and wanted to, to get your hands into bread making for the first time, what would you, you recommend doing? OK, so I would recommend um uh, something on the theme of a semi-risen flatbread so so the two you know obviously the, the one that a lot of people know about is focaccia which is really nice because you can pour, pour as much olive oil as you can handle into it and it's you know makes delicious bread and i put rosemary and uh, sea salt in that um which is delicious and then i kind of on a, on a theme there is nani barbary which is an iranian bread naan n-a-n-e Barbary, B-A-R-B-A-R-I, and you'll find a recipe for it, you know, various places online. And Nani Barbary is, again, another semi-risen flatbread. So you make your dough, fermentation time's much shorter, and then you kind of roll it out and you knead it with your knuckles, you know, rather like focaccia and put holes in it, and then you put some oil on top and, and, and sprinkle it with seeds. And I think kids really like that. And it's, you know, if you get it right, it's really chewy. So it's a really delightful bread. Kids tend to love it, you know, with some... Uh, some dips and you can chuck it into a dip and chew away on it and I think I think it's, it's a lovely bread it's actually one of my favourite breads no, I think okay. thank you so much um, I might even be tempted to try that uh, this weekend so before we finish can I just ask Robert what comes next for you uh, after you've been uh, making oh all of um, this bread what, it, what are you going to be doing in, as your next project <laughs> um, so actually I sort of slightly got diverted from writing books uh, right now well, we've started a tree planting charity locally called Stump Up for Trees and we are trying to plant a million trees across the Brecon Beacons area of South East Wales which is where I live and, and in doing that trying to create a kind of advanced cohort of farmers who will be advocates for change in land management practices and that is proving both incredibly complicated and relatively straightforward at the same time. But that's that's got me for a year or two, I think. So rather than than writing books and baking bread, you're you're planting trees. That's fantastic. And just to say that Charles says Nan Nan Barbary was it that yeah. that's that's what he's going to be making this weekend. So you've inspired him to go and, and, and do that. That's absolutely fantastic. So it just leaves uh, for me to say thank you so much to, to Rob for joining us today and talking us through what is an absolutely fascinating story about about bread, um, not just about the process of baking it, but its history all the way back to the the growing of the different wheats and the importance of wholemeal. Um, as you can tell, I read the book and was inspired to, to bake as well. So thank you so much, Rob, for coming along today. Thank you. Um, so to everyone who's listening now, the recording of this event will be available on the Festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the Festival website after the 20th of June. You will be contacted by email when the video is available to view. If you would like to purchase a copy of Rob's book, Slow Rise, it's going to be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Uh, for more information on book sales, please see the festival website or head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival hyphen of hyphen ideas. And I highly recommend that you take, uh, take a look at that if you're interested and, and I can recommend the recipe at the end too. We very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas. Check out the website, yorkfestivalofideas.com, for full details of all the events in the festival programme. We'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversations using the hashtag YorkIdeas. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>